Um, I'd like to invite all the speakers from the second part this afternoon to, to come back um, for, for questions and discussion. Um, so if you wouldn't mind turning your video cameras on now, that would be great. Thank you. Lovely. So I think we have a question um, in the Q&A, uh, which is um, potentially for, for Tutti and Ellie. So perhaps we can give it to both of you to answer. But um, question around whether there's any work going on to formalise genetic training in cardiology overall. Um, the question is from a genetic counsellor. Um, saying they would have loved a clear course or training resource to develop knowledge in ICC um, and whether you know if there's anything coming or whether it's something we should be looking to do. Um, a course that I did that was really good was the ESHG cardiogenetics course. I think they run it every year. Um, so I'd always recommend that to people if they're asking. Um, but I think Tutti will know much better than me what's in the pipeline as well for everyone else. <laughs> I'll put you on the spot, Tutti. But that, that does seem like a planted question, actually, <laughs> Rachel, because, because um, uh, hopefully, I, I think, Rachel, you're much more um, kind of knee deep into this, but there are plans to develop a, a PG cert um, specifically for ICCs. I think that's really quite timely. Um, there is another... Um, course uh, in Manchester um, that is cardiovascular genetics as well that uh, probably similar Ellie to, to the course that you you're mentioning um, which kind of puts it all together um, in, in 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 a couple of days sort of type of work but I think uh, to get um, a degree or, or a module which you can then port to um, let's say um, a master's, I think, would be would be ideal, and that and a PG cert is probably the way to go. Um, still in development, as of, as as we speak. Yeah, and I think that um, it's one of the things we've thought about uh, or talked about, haven't we, as part of the AICC, is bringing together these re resources into one place so that there is some clearer signposting to what's out there and what can help to get you to where you want to be because there is a lot available but sometimes it's just knowing what and where and how to access it um, but yes we are working up a postgraduate certificate which we hope we will be available for next year so watch watch this space and uh, we'll let you know how that progresses um i i wanted to ask again to ellie and tutti um mainstreaming of genetic testing obviously we expect there to be increased demand and we all know we've talked about funding, Liz has talked about funding, we're limited in our funding and our capacity. You've talked about some of the ways that we might tackle that and I know that there are other thoughts, you know, and I wondered what your other thoughts are and, and particularly around, you know, talks about sort of group counselling sessions, video resources to sort of speed up perhaps the counselling session that you then have um, in person um, and also other roles that um, are, are potentially uh, that you can potentially build into service models such as genomics associates. Wondered what your thoughts are around that. So perhaps if I ask Ellie first uh, and then Tutti the same question. Yeah, I think we've seen a huge change like since COVID basically because we all switched to online working and um, the way we, we changed our clinics um, in terms of genetic counselling was we sw switched them all to virtual as well so um, for my adult patients now they're all having virtual appointments pretty much and then they have the samples done locally and um, in that case it already is less resource taken up um, we're able to see more patients in a short space of time I feel still offering a good service. The patients like it because it's saving them money as well because they don't have to travel in for an appointment. Um, and so it means we're able to offer more with less time and less resources. And I'm definitely a big advocate for genomic associates um, to support us with the work we're doing because a lot of the time we're doing a lot of information gathering and taking down family histories and actually um, my time probably could be better spent actually interacting with patients, but without a genomic associate, you do get bogged down in these kind of more admin -y type tasks as well. Um, so I think all in all, those things taken together, 
can mean we can roll out a much more efficient service kind of using these kind of virtual models of genetic counselling. I, I think in cancer, particularly breast cancer, there's been a lot of there's been clinical trials on um, sort of uh, online counselling and they've proven um, you know, to be non, non inferior and very effective and uh, actually some of the patients welcome them. I think that it, that's I think that study is concluding, but the final reports are still to come. Um, and in the US, they've done quite a lot of um, sort of developing videos um, for counselling and then, you know, bringing the patient in um, for for their one to one. Um, and they're, therefore they're more informed and have their questions prepared um, for you. So I think that, that it's going to, it, it's coming as a result of that. But I think what we need to develop are the, the, the resources that will work for our patients. Um, and um, we are in talks with some of the charities to, to kind of help with that. Um, and, uh, and I guess there's also that changing landscape, I think, that we need to make sure that all the technology we're developing is keeping up with with what we're counselling for and tests that we're counselling for, but yeah, th that 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 is coming, and uh, again, we welcome any ideas or proposals for things like that. Um, and in terms of the other roles, like the genomics associates, I mean, they they form part of a um, sort of a value, you know, they, they form valuable role within within the departments, and uh, in some are also in mainstreaming clinics, so not in working with a genetic um w working in helping out other clinics but sort of allied to a, a clinical genetics department um and i think it's just it's just the deline delineation of roles i think that we really need to kind of be uh, very um clear about um i think that's I think the agency is working on that ellie so hopefully there'll be then clearer sort of um roles and responsibilities um within why that while there may be overlap um uh, I think that's it, it should become a bit more clear with this piece of work being done by the agency. Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, question for Liz. I, I think you probably answered it while I was thinking of questions. I mean, I think we're all, um, it's frustrating, isn't it, that uh, so many of the documents that help us to structure our ICC services suggest that there should be a an embedded psychologist within the service, and yet we all struggle to be able to do that because of funding issues. You've you've told us nicely about all the work that that you've done, and I know it's all very close to you, your heart to progress this. Um, to, to try and fill that gap. What what do you think we could do collectively? Is there are there things that we can work together on to try and, you know, I guess resources and development of resources um, is is helpful in 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 thinking about uh, mental health as well, specific for ICC patients. Yes, it's an excellent question, isn't it? And actually, um, the, I think that when it comes to mental health and any long term condition, not just ICCs, um, it needs to be collective and it needs to be a multidisciplinary approach because the, the whole point is that we're not just funneling and um, sort of waiting for patients to be uh, incredibly unwell from a psychological perspective and then um, funneling through a clinical um psychologist uh, pathway. I think that's a really important pathway, especially for our very, very complex patients and that have other underlying mental health and physical conditions as well. But actually, I think, um, you know, working together in order to address the sort of mild to moderate um, affected group is really, really important. And I think that when we talk about working together, to be clear, I mean with patients, um, not just within our MDTs as well, in order to really hone in what we want to spend our precious money on and what we want to get grants for and what's actually going to be beneficial for patients. Um, because it's such a complex area. And of course, those complexities are different across different conditions as well. So I think, you know, the first step from my perspective Perspective is a real understanding as to what the gaps are and what we really need um, and then being able to use that precious money um, if and when we ever have it um, correctly and appropriately and actually making a difference with it. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Um, there 
is a question in the chat about uh, awareness in primary care and how we can help GPs to become more aware of our referral processes <clears throat> and anecdotal stories of people going to their GPs but um, uh, asking for referrals but being turned away and I think that that's um, very important. I, I don't know if Caroline is uh, still on the call but I was interested to see the work that you've obviously done in Scotland in terms of engaging primary care and laying out um, guidance for GPs uh, around referral. I think it, it you know there are there is work to be done there I think certainly and again probably collectively um, to to try and make that process um, or, or our referral process when we want to see people who we want to see um, and how to refer clearer and obviously there has to be some work done at a regional level to probably try and engage your local GPs in, in, in each um, part of the country. I think one of the things, just a small thing that we were able to do was to introduce the self-referral form. And I don't know how many services are using self-referral forms, um, but that allows us to, um, if we have a patient under our care, we can give a form that they distribute to their family members, they fill that in and they refer themselves directly to us, taking the GP out of the equation. And that certainly, I think, has helped um, uh, for, for our family members. Um, but that doesn't necessarily change when when it's the first person in a family who's who's potentially going to the GP. I, I don't know if there are any thoughts from from the panel around that as well our interaction with GPs. I think that's a great idea to have a self-referral form. I wish we had that. We have a service-initiated referral, um, which is a similar thing, I guess. But if they're struggling to get a referral through the GP, we can refer them in. Um, but self-referral is even better, I guess. I think we don't make it easy for GPs because it seems like everyone's got a different system. Like I'm constantly getting phone calls to me saying, you know, how do I send this electronic referral through? You're not on this system. And and I don't know how it all works either. So I, I don't know if that's a, something we could do sort of more nationally to kind of make it a bit more standardized about how GPs do refer to us because I don't think we make it clear and especially because our services kind of cross geographical boundaries as well they're yeah. not always sure like where to refer and yeah it is it's tricky I think it maybe is more on us than the GPs but I'm not yeah. sure how it all works behind the scenes no 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 I agree it's the coordination of all of that isn't it with family mm. members in different parts of the country and and I think at the moment you, you know a lot of you, you manage a lot of that through seeing the same family at the same centre, If even if it means relatives travelling long distances to try and join up that care. But but how that works kind of going forwards, I, I don't know, particularly perhaps with structuring around GMSAs um, and, and genetic testing. Um, I th think we're probably... I, Caroline, are you are you able to hear us? I think probably not. So um, I think it's probably time to draw everything to a close. Um, we uh, would like to thank our wonderful speakers um, this afternoon. Thank you so much for your excellent talks. Um, we've really enjoyed the session and hope that uh, everybody who joined on the call has too. Thank you for joining us. Um, I think in terms of kind of tying up, there um, will be some feedback forms and brief MCQs available um, for people who've joined the session to, to fill in to get certificates of attendance. So that will be in the next day or two. Otherwise, um, we do have another click running next month on the 12th as well. So it'd be the 12th of October. Um, and that's focused around inherited cardiomyopathies. Promises again to be an excellent session. So hope that you can join us for that. And the last shameless plug for the AICC meeting, which is uh, due to happen at the end of November in London. There is a national training day as part of that on the Thursday, which is the 23rd of November. Um, with, uh, you know, sort of talks that are very much geared towards uh, similarly kind of core learning. 
Um, and then there is the main conference itself on the 24th, uh, which is a Friday. Um, the programmes are online at the AICC website. Uh, the programme for the Cardiomyopathy Click is online on our website. So I hope that we will see you all there. Um, don't know if there's anything you want to add, Steph? No, I think so. Just thanks again to everyone who came. Thank you all and we'll see you again. Thank you. Bye. Bye.